tonight on the final play. Throws over the middle, has a man wide open. That's Lil' Jordan Humphreys across the five. Stiff arms into the end zone. The Saints got their first taste of game action and their first barometer of where they need to improve. That's why we're playing these games, but our pad level, uh, our leverage on the ball, there were a lot of misfits and things that we've got to improve on. We're looking at the performances of Teddy Bridgewater, Taysom Hill, and the rest of the black and gold. Plus, we'll go around South Louisiana to check in on fall camps for our local college football teams. From Fox 8 Sports, this is The Final Play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers. Built Ford Tough. And by Ron Austin Law. Welcome into The Final Play. I'm Juan Kincaid. Now that there's game film, Saints head coach Sean Payton has all that he needs to get his team motivated as they go forward this preseason. It wasn't the perfect preseason opener by any means, but there were some positives, particularly from the quarterback spot. Sean Vazan breaks down Teddy Bridgewater's performance from Friday night. Friday night's preseason opener gave the Saints a glimpse into the future, what the offense would look like if Teddy Bridgewater was starting quarterback. I felt like he was comfortable, you know, and, and uh, he got the ball to the right guy, I mean, pretty quickly. And there's a command, you know, when he was in there, and, and I think that, I think he and Taysom, this training camp, I've noticed uh, a pretty significant difference in how they're performing. Bridgewater had a good night overall was poised and confident and at his best when making quick decisions. That's where he was most accurate. He finished 14 of 19 for 134 yards and a touchdown that came on a well-executed two-minute drive to close out the first half. Our defense did a great job of you know, leaving us enough time to be able to drive down the field and, and score. Um, the guys on the outside did a great job of understanding what plays were calling, uh, getting the signal, communicating, and running the correct routes. Offensive line did a great job of hearing the calls and, and protecting. And uh, all I had to do was sit back and play pitch and catch. Uh, that's something we've been working on over these last couple days. Two minute and uh, to be able to get the rep, two minute in a game like situation, in an, an actual game, uh, it's a plus. And it's a great learning opportunity for a lot of guys. But while he earned a positive grade, Bridgewater wasn't perfect. He was sacked four times, though two were negated by penalty. But on them, his tendency to hold on to the ball too long contributed. Bridgewater is in a unique spot. Could be heir apparent to the best to ever wear a Saints uniform. He knows that's a Herculean task, but also knows while he's always learning from Drew Brees, he'll never be Drew Brees, so he won't try to be. I think last year and earlier this spring, I found myself trying to do exactly what Drew does. And I had to, you know, take a step back and just tell myself, hey, you know, I'm not Drew, but Drew is the standard. So, you know, with that mindset, it's like, hey, you know, you're chasing perfection, you're, ch you're chasing excellence, but at the same time, you have to remember that, you know, you're yourself, you have to be yourself. And when I'm in there, you know, I try to do things in a way that Drew would do them, but, you know, I try to put my own little spin on it. You heard him, now you see him. Mm -hmm. Sean Mazan here on the final play. Listen, we've got a football team that didn't play great, didn't play bad, but when you're looking at individual performances, you want to start first and foremost with Teddy Bridgewater. He wasn't spectacular, but he showed a substantial amount of improvement from this time last year, and that's what you wanted to see. Yeah, you know, I think what happened with him was, because I'd kind of been waiting for this, but when we watch him practice and watch him practice, all his good throws, good plays kind of came randomly. Yeah. You weren't really sure what, where does he really stand yeah. out, but in this game, he really showed you where he stands out. That's with the quick decision passing game right off the line of scrimmage or making that pre-snap read where he knows where he's going with the football. When he's doing that, that's when he's most accurate, that's when he's most decisive, that's when he's at his best. Now, longer developing plays uh, where the, the anticipation and the timing is a little bit off, that's why he got sacked a couple of times. And I went back and checked my notes, because it's always hard to judge sacks in training camp, but I went back and, and checked my notes. He's been sacked by far the most of any quarterback during training camp. So I think that's something he has to work on. They want to see progress from him as they go forward here in the first four games. All right, so Taysom Hill got the whole amount of second half snaps. Not bad. Not bad. We saw more of a quarterback mm -hmm. decision-making Taysom Hill than a guy being thrown in there and saying, well, go, go play quarterback right now. 
You know, I like what I saw out of Taysom Hill. You know, I, I know some weren't as high on him, but I actually like what I saw from him. Uh, I thought he was patient in the pocket. I thought he made a few throws. I thought he was a little inaccurate, a little jumpy at times, but it, when he took off and ran, it was after he was going through his reads. It wasn't like he was just at the, the, the side of first sign of trouble. He was running. No, he was going through his reads. He was patient and then taking off. And look, that's a skill set that he has. Yes, yes. Might as well use it. So uh, it's marrying the two extremes together. His challenge is always how much development is he getting as a quarterback versus doing the, the dual threat Swiss Army knife role that he has within this offense. But I thought he showed clear clutch strides from last year as a true quarterback. We talked about it on the podcast, and I asked the question, what, what it, well, I made the point, it seems to me that Taysom has kind of reached a point in his career, not just in the NFL, but especially with the Saints, that it seems like he wants to focus more on the opportunity of being a quarterback in this league. Do you think he sees the writing on the wall that it's not going to happen here as a starter, that it, but it may happen someplace else if it continues to develop? <sighs> That's hard to tell. I mean, I haven't really pick, picked up on any of that from, vibe from the locker room just in terms of that he's, he's frustrated or anything like that. I, today at practice, he was working with as a, as a tight end, as an H-back, as a slot receiver, yeah. doing pump return stuff. So this year, he's going to play a lot. They have a lot. He's going to be on the football field. And if you're a football player, you want to be on the football field. So, look, he gets more time than the backup quarterback does. Yeah. So, uh, look, eventually... He's going to want to be a true quarterback because eventually he's not going to be able to do everything forever. Yeah. But I think right now, this is kind of his role. He's got to kind of accept it. So what players helped themselves the most from Friday? I think there were two. I thought little Jordan Humphrey, who has been wildly inconsistent in practice, I thought he really helped himself with two big catches uh, that yak run after, uh, you know, yards after yeah. catch, run after catch. Uh, I thought he was exceptional with the, the first down play and then obviously uh, the touchdown pass. And Deontay Harris, who had been injured, yeah. uh, Special had team, kind of flashed early in camp, then got injured, then had a couple of nice returns, really has got some speed and really sees the field well with their space and uh, was really able to, to capitalize on the kickoff return game. Those two guys in particular really play well. Throw another name out there because he, he played on the offensive line and he hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention, but Will Clapp played well as well. Okay. So just something to keep in mind that competition. Throw this one in. Does Cyril Grayson show you a little bit more with the nice catch you had? He didn't do much on special teams. He's got to fill well, his way around Well, he had a nice return. There. He had a decent yeah. return, but you can see that he's still trying to figure that part of the game out. But the catch he made, nice catch. It wasn't just nice going catch. Deep. It wasn't just him going on a deep post yeah. in the middle of the field and running under it. He had, to, had that sense of time and the turn and catch yeah. it from Teddy Bridgewater. I thought he played well, uh, had the nice return. I do think, though, he has got to figure out somewhere on special teams where he can stand out or he's going to be a long shot to make Maybe a gunner or something like that. Marcus Davenport, I'm not sure if he helped himself or he hurt himself. Where are things with him right now, you think? I think it's probably right in the middle there. I, I, I haven't seen a whole lot in terms of flash plays this camp from Marcus Davenport. I haven't seen any uh, egregious mistakes. Yeah. Um, it depends on what the coach what coaches want to see at this point in his career. He's in his you know, second training camp. He's fully healthy. Um, obviously, you want to see that growth. And look, we've talked about this. He's got to at least be what Alex Okafor was. Because yeah. if he's not, I think this defense can suffer as a whole. Yeah. So I think his development is crucial to this team. Do you think he's where they expect him to be at this time, year number two, training camp number two? Or does he need to be further along as a first-round pick? That, that you're putting a yeah. lot in by letting Alex Okafor go. Look, I, I just haven't seen the flash plays yet. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he's probably made some down-to-down -down nice plays mm -hmm. that don't necessarily show up on the stat sheet. So who knows inside the locker room? I, I think perhaps he could flash a little bit he more. He needs to show progression in this preseason, in the games at least, right? He From played, two he, to three to four. Yeah, I would say so. I think it, that's – I don't know if he plays in, 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 uh, the, fourth, in yeah. the fourth preseason yeah. game, but I, I would think – at some point, you want to see some form of progress from your first-round pick a year ago. What didn't help the Saints in that first preseason game, not much of a pass rush whatsoever. Obviously, Davenport had a lot to do with that. But where that affects the team is in the secondary, when you guys got, got like Eli Apple and P.J. Williams struggling a little bit on the corner. And you saw that. One affects the other. Yeah, look, I think the secondary is good, but I think they're even better when they have a pass rush that can get after the quarterback. Most Last year, they had 49 sacks as a team. That helps. It really does. Um, but if it's an average pass rush, I think all of a sudden that good secondary gets closer to above average to average yeah. in that point. So uh, at that point, so I think the pass rush, this this secondary, the way this defense is kind of predicated, you need a pass rush for everything else behind it to really be as elite as they can be. Every team has a weakness. They have a vulnerability. When you look at this Saints team after just one preseason game and then combine that with what's happened in training camp, where's its biggest vulnerability? I, I'm going to say it until I see something different. Um, 
the backup tackle spot okay. behind Armstead and Ramchek, I'm concerned because, because you know Armstead's you know the history. Go, yeah. 21 missed games over the last three seasons, yeah. and I don't see anything out of any of the guys that they have right now uh, playing that spot. I know they have Michael Ola. I know Ulrich John just was put, put on IR. Um, Marshall Newhouse has gotten some work back there. Ethan Greenidge. I just haven't seen it. Yeah. So and I think that's an area where the Saints must be uh, you would think they're they're scanning other rosters to see yeah. what's available at some point because right now I think that's a vulnerable spot. But there are going to be some tough cuts for Sean Payton. This is probably the deepest team he's had since he's been mm -hmm. here. The toughest cuts come from where? Is it the pretty obvious? Spots? I'm going to go back to wide receiver yeah. um, because I think you have Trey Quan, you have Ted Ginn, you have Michael Thomas, then you have uh, Emmanuel Butler who returned today and had a good day. Mm -hmm. But you got to pick up where he left off. Had a good day. You got Keith Kirkwood, who's been uh, absent with yeah. an injury. You got Austin Carr. Yeah. You got Keith Kirkwood, who I just mentioned. Little Jordan, uh, Little Jordan Humphrey. And you know, Rashard Matthews just left the team. Yeah. They, I mean, they cut him, but he just he just left the team. So uh, I think I think wide receiver, depending on the numbers, do you keep five? Do you keep six? I don't know if you really need to keep six at this point. I, I think all these players, uh, they've all had their moments in camp. They've all flashed in camp. They've all had their moments. So. I think that's going to be the toughest cut. Not just who makes it, yeah. but how many do you keep? Second toughest cut, maybe running back for that third the spot? The third spot? Yeah, look, I think Dwayne Washington was in the lead going into the game. I think he's still in the lead. But don't discount Devon Ozigbo. Yeah. Uh, he, keeps, he keeps showing up, and yeah. he's consistently gotten better. They bring in guys. They've already Jaquez Rogers. Uh, Jaquez Rogers. Um, so, look, I think that's an open competition. But I think right now it's Washington, but I think that's still going to be a tough cut. Okay, we'll leave it right there with Sean Mazan here on the final play. Thanks, Sean. All right. Hey, look what comes back tomorrow, 1035, the Black and Gold Review makes a return. Deuce Bacal says Sean Vazan and I are on set for 30 minutes of Saints Talk. Not only do we talk about the game that just happened, but we look ahead to the next one as well. And we answer your questions you send to us by clicking on the final word feature on the final play app. The Black and Gold Review makes its return Monday night, tomorrow night at 1035. We are just getting started with a busy night of the final play. Still ahead, Teddy played well, but so too did Taysom Hill. Chris Hagan will take a look back at his performance against the Vikings. And later, finish, finish, and set go. we've got plenty of college football to get to with campus visits to LSU, Tulane, Nichols, and Southeastern on the way. Saints fans who want to see their team spirit on television can head to the Final Play app to submit a picture. Just click the menu, scroll down to the Submit Your Saints Picks page, and from there, just follow the directions. Tune in throughout the season to see your hoot at passion on display. Offensively speaking, one big takeaway from the first preseason game, the guys taking snaps behind Drew Brees have gotten better since last preseason, particularly Taysom Hill, who continues to show why he's such a weapon with the ball in his hands. Here's Chris Hagan. Taysom Hill's role with the Saints is about as unique as they come. There aren't many third-string quarterbacks that are locks to make their team, just like there aren't many, if any, that are asked to line up in several other positions on offense and special teams. But as glorious as it's become, it's far from easy. Hill has to walk the tightrope that's become balancing his growth under center to his importance within the rest of the Saints offense. Part of training camp is getting ready for the season, and so I'm trying to make sure that I'm ready to do everything else that I will be asked to do during the season, but I still want to make sure that I'm progressing as a quarterback. It's still early in my career. I'm still figuring out how to manage all that, but uh, I had a lot of fun being able to play quarterback. While the backup job is Bridgewater's, Saints fans should be able to relax a little more during the pass attempts that Hill does manage to get every now and then throughout the year. He's visibly more comfortable in his natural position, the key during the real season, when he's not under center on every single down like he was on Friday night, is being able to switch roles in a matter of seconds and make the transition seamless. It's such a different mindset when you're playing tight end or uh, fullback or you know whatever it may be where I might be blocking at the point of attack on a run and so much happens in between the tackles and in those runs and your hands get beat up and um, it's a physical game and then you have to step in a quarterback and uh, you know you have to you have to play the violin and it's a difficult transition and um, I think a night like tonight where you can focus on just playing quarterback and, and going through all of your pre-snap reads and, and all of that um, definitely allows me to get into more of a rhythm and 
you know, calm down. As Drew Brees always says, it's time on task that helps more than anything. And clearly, the more Taysom plays quarterback, the better he gets. Hopefully, one day, he has that opportunity. Just like any game or just like any practice, there are plays that you would like to have back. But um, I think overall, preseason one, I thought, it was, I thought it was good. The good news for Taysom is it's just preseason game number one, and there's still plenty of time to improve at all of his many positions because we all know once the regular season rolls around, he could line up at just about any position on any given play. Reporting at the Superdome, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Up next on the final play, from uptown to Baton Rouge, the bayou to Hammond, America, we're crisscrossing southeast Louisiana as we head to campus. And be sure to subscribe to the Fox 8 Overtime podcast for more Saints analysis on demand. You can find our podcast, The Normal Spots, fox8live.com, the final play app, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Final play, sponsored by... You're watching the final play. In less than three weeks, all of our college football teams will have a game under their belts. Hopefully, all wins. Up in Baton Rouge, much of the offseason talk has been about LSU's change of philosophy on offense. Not completely gone is the team's ground and pound approach, but they are expected to be a lot more pass friendly on offense, which puts added pressure on quarterback Joe Burrow. And practice is where the offense is getting fine-tuned. And these are exciting times for the guys that will be catching balls in the new pass-happy offense. I mean, we're throwing the ball way more than we, we did last year, so that's just exciting for us receivers. It feels good just to, you know, keep moving the pace, uh, especially at a faster pace than we did last year. Because, you know, we feel that uh, moving the ball at a faster pace is going to get the defense on the heels. And uh, we're going to be able to make bigger plays, just really move the ball quicker and move the score really faster. Meanwhile, uptown at Tulane, the expectation is to keep the winning going. They want back-to-back -back bowl victories and an outright conference title. So they're tweaking the offense just a bit in hopes of reaching their goals. Once again, here's Chris Hagan. At every level of football, having a quarterback with experience is key. And that's a big part of what's raised the expectations for the Green Wave this year. Justin McMillan returns to hopefully pick up where this team left off. But the other part of the equation is the new offense that's built around him. It, it feels like you're playing little league again. You know, just get the ball in players' hands and make a play. Nobody's overthinking. Nobody's thinking about making mistakes. Everybody's literally having fun. Still, fun has to result in wins and more wins than their seven a year ago. This team hasn't been shy about their goal of taking home an AAC conference title. And new offensive coordinator Will Hall hopes his scheme plays a big role in reaching that goal. I like the fact we run multiple personnel. We, we run at a fast tempo. We can also slow it down if we want to. Uh, I think he uses the whole field horizontally, vertically. We're operating at, at, a, at a really good tempo. Uh, we're playing really fast. I've been, I've been pleased for the most part with that. Um, you know, like I said, our older guys have got a good grasp of our base. Uh, our young guys, we're trying to bring them along because we need them. When you get into the specifics of this new offense, one different element that we're told we'll notice right away is the role of the running back. This is a position group that caught less than 20 passes combined last year, but Coach Hall says that number will be a lot different and a lot higher in 2019. You know, we're more of a pro-style passing game, so when you look at the Saints and other NFL teams, you know, when you're looking at a progression-based pass, and game, uh, the backs have got to be a part of that. And uh, our guys have embraced that. Coach Hall came in here and told us, like, the more I can do with you, the more I'm going to play you. So, you know, that's what I want to do. And you certainly won't hear any complaints about it from McMillan. You'll see backs from last year do multiple things this year coming up uh, that you probably never thought you would see from from, from people like Darius or Amari or, or the YG and Bookers. And, but uh, our, our back, our running back room, I say is, you know, top, top talent on our, on our team. And you know, we're, we're going to live in our running back room on this offense, so uh, whether it's in the air or on the ground. Reporting on the Green Wave, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Down in Thibodeau, Nickel State just finished up their first 100-play scrimmage. Because of current injuries, head coach Tim Rebo is looking for some depth at certain positions. The Colonels are picked to win the Southland Conference this year, which is quite the turnaround for the Nickel State Colonels, who just four years ago, when Rebo took over the program, were picked to finish dead last. 
He said at one point he was worried about the players reading their own clippings, but not anymore. It was a little bit more difficult after media day, you know, because of the expectations and where they picked this and what, what guys are saying. But it's really been easy once camp has started because the focus is just ball, ball, ball. Uh, you look up and every day and uh, we have that same routine of where we meet and practice and meet and practice and walk through. Uh, it's, it's easy to focus on that and not look too far ahead. So our guys have been doing a really, really good job of that. And up in Hammond, Southeast is going through its second fall camp with head coach Frank Selfo, who came on board last year. The Lions put on the pads last week and now have 12 practices under their belts. Selfo said he's been pleased with how his team has embraced the increased physicality in fall camp. It's uh, too early to tell, but we're running around. Got a lot of excitement, a lot of guys playing with some energy, and that's good. We're seeing some of the athleticism of the freshmen that we just brought in, so that's a huge positive. Now, they don't know where they're going or what they're doing yet, but they'll learn that, and that's going to come, and they'll let you play faster, so I'm encouraged by that. The start of the 2019 season is right around the corner, and just in case you're wondering when and where for our local teams, Tulane and Southeastern get things started at home on the 29th of August. The Wave hosting Florida International, the Lions welcoming Jacksonville State to Hammond. LSU's opener will be on the 31st at home, again against Georgia Southern. Also on the 31st, the Cardinals, they begin their season on the road at Kansas State. We'll hit the home stretch of the final play after this break. Coming up, our play of the week. Our Fox 8 catch of the week comes from one of the Saints rookie receivers, Lil Jordan Humphreys. He had the Saints second touchdown in Friday's game against the Vikings, and he did most of the work himself. The toss from Taysom Hill, Humphreys with the catch, and then the stiff arm to get himself into the end zone. It's our Fox 8 catch of the week. And this programming reminder every Tuesday night to join us for Fox 8 Overtime at 1035. The four guys in sports here at Fox 8, we sit around the campfire, talk a little sports, everything from LSU, Saints, Tulane, Pelicans, Nichols, Southeast, and we go up and down the line talking sports. Again, Fox Hit Overtime. Join us every Tuesday night at 1035. And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers. Built Ford Tough. And by Ron Austin Law.